This week, Kelly Shortridge, Senior Principal Product Technologist at Fastly, will be here to talk about deciduous decision trees and security chaos engineering. Next up, Deb Ratcliffe, the strategic analyst and author from the Cyber Risk Alliance, will join us to discuss penning a cyber thriller. Finally, in the Enterprise Security News, Gardecore has an announcement to stop ransomware. Netscope streamlines procedures with improved attribution models and collaboration. Cloudflare claims they block the greatest DDoS attack in history. Security Scorecard partners up with Tenable to improve risk management. Sumo Logic delivers on the sore promise by acquiring DF Labs. Scar invests in cyber startup Hook Security. Hunters raises $30 million in a Series B and so much more. Stay tuned for Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly. For security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Every 11 seconds, there's a new ransomware attack. Oil pipelines, universities, corporations, all paying millions of dollars. Barracuda says, don't pay the ransom. Before a ransomware attack occurs, train your teams to recognize an attack and use anti-phishing technology. Protect your applications and they can't get onto your network. Simple backup and restore solutions quickly recover your data without paying the ransom. Build your ransomware protection plan now by visiting securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. That's securityweekly.com forward slash Barracuda. Welcome to episode number 240 of Enterprise Security Weekly for August 25th, 2021. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian, joined remotely by Adrian Sanabria. Adrian, welcome. Hey, thanks. Looking forward to both our interviews today. We uh, two, two book authors. Yeah. Two book authors awesome. in a row. Yeah. It's going to be some good stuff. Really good. Uh, Mr. Tyler Shields is here. We're working on getting him reconnected back into the show. Tyler, welcome. Okay, well, we'll do that after. Uh, he will be here uh, for this episode. So, uh, a couple, a quick announcement. Uh, join us on August 26th at 11 a.m. Eastern Time to learn how to implement cloud security that actually works. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash webcast to register today. If you missed any of our previously recorded webcasts or technical trainings, they're available for your viewing pleasure at securityweekly.com forward slash on demand. Also, don't forget this Thursday. Tune into Paul Security Weekly. I'm super excited about a technical segment that I am giving on OpenVAS. That's right. You learn how to compile it from scratch because if you don't know how it works under the covers when it breaks, you'd be really screwed. And I went through all of the pain for you and uh, will show you how all that works. It's going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Kelly Shortridge built the app Deciduous with Ryan Petrick. Uh, Deciduous simplifies the process of creating security decision trees, which are crucial aids for threat modeling and prioritization or uh, prioritizing mitigations. Kelly, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me on. It's nice to have you. Uh, Kelly, I want to get started with, well, I guess first, how did you get your start uh, in information security? Yeah, so um, it was a bit of a weird start. I actually started out as an investment banker doing M&A, as well as some private capital raises, both for cybersecurity companies and data analytics companies. And uh, I really like the finance part, actually, but I fell in love with really like digging into the technology and the market problems. So um, right after banking, I founded my own startup, which was acquired. And since then, I've been doing a myriad of different kind of product roles trying to solve various uh, security and resilience problems felt by users. Outstanding. What, what is a security decision tree? Yes, so decision trees are not exclusive to cybersecurity, to be clear. Um, probably some of the audience is familiar with game theory. Um, and one of the key like concepts or tenets in game theory, at least for sequential games, is like one player makes a move, think like chess, then another player is going to respond to it. So one of the aids that can help you make better decisions in a game context, again, let's say it's chess, it could be like nuclear war at the other end of the spectrum. You want to try to anticipate your opponent's moves. Um, a lot of people uh, stick to what's called first order thinking. So it's, you know, I'll make a move and maybe you'll think about, you know, your, how your opponent will respond to it. 
But the beauty of decision trees and this um, underlying principle called belief prompting is that if you prompt yourself to think about, okay, I make this move, the attacker will respond this way, and then what do I do next? What will they do next? And you start really anticipating like all of the different like branches and opportunities, kind of like uh, if you've seen the show Loki recently, like the multiverse, like there are all mm -hmm. these kind of like avenues that could happen. Um, so being able to map that out in a visual way through a decision tree um, can be incredibly useful, again, just to kind of document your assumptions about how things are going to work. And then in a cybersecurity context, it can actually start evaluating, like, let's say with, um, you know, like phishing, that's probably easier for an attacker than like trying to find some sort of like uh, O'Day in AWS's control plane, right? It's a lot easier just to try to steal credentials. Um, so you can start to see that on the tree. Maybe one branch has phishing, another branch has O'Day. And then you can really get a better sense of like, okay, what's most likely to happen in my systems for a particular kind of use case? And what should basically, what are the kind of easy path for attackers um, that think low hanging fruit that we can mitigate first? Because I think uh, many people have seen that sometimes we buy like sexy, shiny, like anti APT stuff when we still have huge problems with again, like phishing and things that are accidentally made public. Um, and a decision tree can just help you really like have a visual guide, help you collaborate and figuring out what actually is the best course of action in terms of mitigations and like what is the most likely attack path, at least that you anticipate um, for whatever system is in question, whether like an S3 bucket or like some sort of like, again, production service. It could be even just your, um, you know, something related to Active Directory. Like you can choose whatever. The whole point is just you're seeing like, OK, Tacker will probably start by trying this. We'll mitigate it with this, and then what are they going to do next? And a lot of people don't think about that, like how are attackers going to evolve um, or change their kind of like decision-making criteria based on the mitigations that are in place? Because they won't just stop or give up, right? Yeah, it's, it and, sounds uh, like a, a more structured way to do threat modeling, in a, in a sense. Yes, exactly. And I think the beauty here is it's um, because it's domain agnostic, it's something that is pretty intuitive. Um, for instance, if you're having to collaborate um, with software engineering teams um, on building threat models for like a new, uh, you know, a new system or is some sort of uh, end user facing like service. It's very, it makes it a lot clearer than just talking about like, oh yeah, here's, you know, like here's kind of at an abstract level, here are the risks that we think about. Instead, it's like, nope, these are kind of exactly the things that we think attackers will consider. And it can be very elucidating for people who aren't in security all the time to understand like, oh, that makes total sense how attackers will escalate their investment. And like, again, paying attention to some of those low hanging fruit where maybe a simple design change could actually eliminate that path entirely, which is really mm. powerful. Yeah, it's all about eliminating the variance. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, it seems like, um, I don't know, a lot of conversations I have when, when I'm advising companies and having some of these conversations, you know, seem like those feel like I'm taking crazy pills types of conversations where, you know, it seems like a something like a decision tree, you know, can help you deal with a lot of these emotional biases and inherent human biases that we have when making decisions, you know, and, you know, you'll be having this conversation, you know, and, and, and you're like, well, these basic things get the attackers in every time. And they're like, but this is cool. This is really cool. <laughs> you know, it's, and they go by the, the cool shiny thing anyway, but, uh, you know, and it's it's just after a point, it's not satisfying to say I told you so anymore. So, I, I love that it's visual. You know, I, th I think I think something visual like you can fit a whole decision tree, and you've got many examples in this book that fit on a single page. And for me, at least, um, and I've noticed some of the people I work with that that goes a long way. Like you can verbally say what's on that page till you're blue in the face, but something about seeing it. Uh, at, at least to me, uh, makes it much more valuable. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it's really important for kind of a knowledge culture. You want transparency and accessibility and even again, notes in a document, like that can be tough. But when you literally have a, like a visual aid, if let's say an incident happens and you realize that, oh, maybe we had some like assumptions that were missing or like, yeah, we got the assumptions correct, but we thought the attacker might try this first versus what they actually did. You can literally just like, take that um, and in like a Zoom meeting like we're on now, start, you know, pointing to the different assumptions. You can cross things out and obviously update them. It's like a very flexible sort of kind of like knowledge capture device, um, which again, I think 
uh, documentation is something safe to say, not just in InfoSec, basically anyone in engineering kind of hates putting it together, but I like to think this is a slightly more fun way of actually doing threat modeling exercises and having kind of this living document that can evolve over time. Yeah, I like the living well, so document because I feel like the a tabletop instant response exercise, it, it doesn't often produce documentation as you're referencing. Exactly, yep, and it means that, you know, I think something you hear about a lot is the you know cyber skills shortage. And uh, at the very least, it means there's generally a lot of turnover. You can have lots of new people rather than them having to go talk to a bunch of different people to get a sense of like, okay, what's our you know threat profile across different resources. Now there's these decision trees. Again, they'll share a common format um, and hopefully it will be easier for them to get up to speed. And kind of in that vein, if you have multiple decision trees, maybe you see, for instance, like most likely two-factor authentication applies to a lot of different kind of like threat modeling scenarios as far as a mitigation. So if you start comparing the trees and you see particular mitigations that keep coming up, mm -hmm. particularly again on those kind of easy paths for attackers, then that's to me very strong signal that that's somewhere you should invest. Again, if it's some, you know, like, uh, you know, upstream supply chain attack and that's only relevant for, you know, I don't know, like uh some super critical application that's in some private, you know, AWS, whatever, like probably you don't need to invest in that first versus like, again, the two factor stuff and a lot of the basics that people talk about, but often don't actually implement. Yeah. Like one control can eliminate multiple timelines and variants. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good analogy. Pa yeah. Yeah. Pa Paul's, uh, he, he gets those Loki references in there. Yeah. He's, I, he's, I like he's Loki. That's good one. Quite a bit. Such a good show. Yeah. Hey Kelly, I have um, a question for you. Um, real quickly, do you do you recommend tying um, quantification metrics to the decision trees, a la like EV or expected value metrics, when you think of it in game theory terms? Yes, and that's actually something. Um, I think in the Black Hat talk I gave in 2017, I did have the kind of um, probability figures on the decision tree itself. Right now, we don't have that in Deciduous. I think it's still early enough. I mean, the Security Chaos Engineering ebook only came out late last year, right? So not everyone's read it yet. Um, so I think getting people kind of just comfortable with decision trees in general for threat modeling is step one. One thing we are considering, and shout out to the fact that we are, um, Ryan and I are actively collecting feedback on Deciduous as we plan on building out the feature set. One of the things we have in mind, um, I think it was Ryan McGeehan, who goes by Magoo, suggested it, um, is having some sort of you know input field so you can assign probabilities like how likely you think it is for an attacker to pursue one action versus another, which can definitely get interesting. Um, but we're not there yet. Yeah, absolutely. I could see you adding probabilities to be able to calculate um, kind of the risk reward of going down a certain tree, and then coupling that with the potential for financial loss to get a true expected value on each tree path. Um, but it's that's kind of taking it to the full extent of, you know, uh, game theory and probability modeling. Yeah, and I would say that um, there can be numbers can impart a like sense of safety and control. Um, I would say the vast majority of organizations I talk to aren't really ready to actually think about sure. probability. Like right now, I think we're still at the phase where we need people to just like embrace some of the lessons from behavioral game theory. Um, and uh, which is which is different, by the way, different outcomes than with traditional kind of theoretical game theory, because behavior game theory looks at how people actually behave, which is not, you know, purely rational, um, so to speak. So I think it's just good to encourage security teams to start just like, get familiar with kind of some of the one on ones around behavior game theory. And if you want to do fancier stuff, you better make sure that uh, you haven't ignored some of the basics because it's going to look kind of silly if you have all this fancy like risk modeling and math around it, and then you had like a very obvious snafu, like a yellow sex sort of thing um, somewhere else on the tree. So I would say like be humble um, when starting out with decision trees and then expand your program from there. Yeah, I love that. Build the basics, build the foundation and go up from there. Exactly, yeah, and test like, um, again, like it, it can be useful to just even start with um, maybe something that's not quite as critical and see how the decision tree works out and what are the changes, get feedback from other stakeholders, whether again, that could be legal finance, but especially again, engineering peers, like make sure that the organization kind of feels comfortable before going on a little in. I mean, I, I would love if everyone in security used deciduous, right? But that's the real advice is like start with, um, you know, start building up kind of that culture from a grassroots perspective. Don't just force it on everyone all at once. 
So one one thing uh, you mentioned earlier that that I think was uh, uh, really interesting to me, something I hadn't considered, you know, talking about documenting uh, what actually happened. You know, I think uh, a, a large part of what we're talking about is is preparation. You know, but before the incident happens. You know, but it sounds like you were you were saying it's it's also useful to uh, document like during lessons learned to see where maybe your decisions tree, uh, you know, we're missing some things, you know, o- o- overlay them and, and see what was missing and maybe improve your models. So, you know, is that where you were going with that? Yes. Yeah, so it really is two use cases, like you said, preparation and threat modeling. Um, but part of uh, the kind of underpinning of security cast engineering, other than experimentation, and it's related to this, is kind of a continuous learning culture, um, making sure that you have like really strong feedback loops, probably people in the audience are familiar with OODA loops. It's very similar to that. Um, so when you're doing an incident retrospective, uh, whether that is because of an experiment, like a security chaos engineering experiment or a real incident, if you pull up the decision tree, um, there are two key benefits. One is um, there there's a tendency to succumb to outcome and hindsight bias whenever we're doing those things. We're like, oh, well, of course, it should have been obvious that we should have patched this thing sooner, whatever it is, right? Um, and so having that kind of visual aid that shows your documented assumptions makes it a lot easier to pinpoint like, okay, like here's where like the knowledge gap was like, and that can inform basically like where the knowledge gaps might be on other decision trees. So it helps kind of counter some of that bias and keep you more objective in like um, being able to kind of uh, more objectively, I guess, analyze the assumptions you had beforehand rather than succumbing to those biases. The second key benefit is um, obviously incident retrospectives ideally are blameless, but they can be heated. And so um, having this document um, and having the tree can help keep people kind of neutral rather than pointing fingers at any one particular team or party. It's like, okay, now we're, we're collaborating on this, you know, blame the tree if you want to. It's like, oh, the tree was yeah. bad. Um, but at least then you're not blaming each other or saying that, oh, like, you know, um, so-and-so was stupid or silly for having overlooked this thing, especially the if you thing, built the tree in the first place collaboratively. The thing we try not to say, which is I told you so. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> and that can even be helpful is showing that, well, we had identified that this is a potential path attackers could have taken and we had a proposed mitigation, but it wasn't implemented. That can be really powerful kind of going forward to get buy-in. And again, you can start to see once you build out multiple trees, like, if there was a gap here, that probably means that there's a similar gap in, you know, right. these different systems. So you can kind of, again, continuously refine those assumptions you have about attacker behavior, which get very powerful. The tree told you so is basically what, yes. how you should phrase exactly. it, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, so, so that's a big part of the book. Yeah, that's actually where you start out in the book is getting into kind of the, the emotions of it, you know, and, and, and the, I, I think in a lot of organizations, it's kind of a cultural uh, you know, missing cultural piece, you know, embracing failure and in a culture that learns from failure instead of blaming people. And, um, yeah, I still run into people regularly that, um, you know, they, they want to hire a CISO who's never been through a breach, you know, or, you know, somebody, you know, that has breaches on, on their resume is, is somehow undesirable. And, and to me, that's a bit bizarre. It's like, why, why would you, <laughs> as common as they are these days, why would you want somebody who's completely, a whole team, security team, that's completely inexperienced, um, you know, with this kind of like ultimate negative outcome that we're trying to protect against? I couldn't agree more. Yeah, failure is a fantastic teacher. And I think there's a, I agree, there's a cultural stigma kind of against failure. And I think a lot of the market kind of distortions we see certainly in terms of the tools that are being purchased, um, even some of the policies and practices that are way too heavy handed and the reason why InfoSec is branded the department of no. because we're always trying to prevent something that's inevitable from happening. I think we can all agree like, you know, it's, it's interesting. I don't necessarily agree with the like attackers only need one way in and you have to cover literally everything. Yeah. You don't have to cover literally everything. Not everything matters, but if, if that is true, um, then even so, um, you, um, yet you certainly can't be taking the, um, general, I guess the general, again, cultural thing around like, okay, like this is, um, figuring out the best way to put it. Um, it's, I guess it's really important in any sort of culture to say like, okay, like failure is inevitable. Like let's learn from it. Let's not blame everyone. Um, and importantly, like let's try to recover from it as soon as possible. So it's a subtle shift from like, let's try to prevent failure to less, let's recover from failure as quickly as possible. But 
underlying that, it kind of belies its actual power because when you shift away to that mindset, you actually buy a whole different suite of tools. Some of the traditional kind of blocking things or you know, preemptive scanning, you're going to have to buy that for compliance anyway, right? But when you move from the mindset um, of like, oh my God, we have to stop it from happening in the first place, which is impossible. It's like absolutely impossible. I think it's both freeing um, emotionally, but it's also freeing in terms of like, now you can focus on more strategic work, make sure you're building muscle memory about responding to incidents um, without feeling bad when the inevitable does go wrong. We shouldn't feel so bad or guilty that something has happened. The whole point is like recover from it and move on. I think it's what I find beautiful both about security chaos engineering and the kind of resilience engineering as a macro category is that's true in any discipline, right? We're never going to stop hurricanes or natural disasters, but um, we can absolutely make sure we can recover from them, that we can evolve kind of our methods, like not build in flood zones as um, or earthquake zones as like New Zealand did after the Christchurch earthquake. Like there are different tactics we can take um, to make ourselves more resilient to failure when it happens. But in InfoSec, that's not the mindset. And I think that's why, frankly, we don't see a lot of progress in the problem because we're trying to stop something that decades of experience has shown us is impossible to stop. I, I'd love to get your opinion on you know, so one thing that's kind of frustrated me is finding, you know, real occurrences, you know, real lessons learned from from actual incidents. You know, unless it's it's huge like Equifax, you know, and there's some kind of class action lawsuit or, you know, something that that, you know, results in in sharing the details of the the incident response report. Uh, generally, we we often don't find out exactly how that failure occurred. You know, do do you feel like it's important? important to well yeah i I, i'm I'm figuring you're probably going to say yes so i guess the question is more like like how do how do we get that out you know does that have to be regulation you know where uh you know we basically force companies to share more details uh about what happened so that we we can improve from it or um i don't know is it more of a cultural shift you know where we get companies uh you know more more comfortable with sharing their mistakes I think um, to your point, there's some element of culture because if people aren't even hiring CISOs who've been through incidents, like why are they gonna talk about them, right? Um, You've set up perfectly though, a huge part of the rationale and justification behind security cast engineering. So the idea is you inject faults um, into your system. Let's say it's like you make sure certain ports are open and then you just see and experiment with like, how do things fail? Like, um, does that mean that suddenly you're getting like, very much unwanted traffic. Um, you can set up, I actually have a forthcoming paper talking about the concept of deception environments, but you can uh, basically like create a shadow copy of prod to see you know, if you change different variables within that, how does it affect security posture. The long and short is basically security chaos engineering that allows you to test your hypothesis about what will happen in certain kinds of incidents, allows you to see like, okay, is our alerting kind of working as expected? Was there anything that we didn't expect? Um, for instance, maybe a like service that you think is relatively benign, let's say it doesn't process customer data. If you inject some sort of fault, like um, a just denial of service, and suddenly there's some sort of outage or downtime or whatever else that then indicates like actually this is kind of a s- centralized um, like risk node, so to speak, because it talks to other components. I think SolarWinds being a classic example of like a lot of times we overlook the things that connect ev- into everything else. But with security chaos engineering, you can experiment with like what happens if you know our automation server uh, goes offline, as it would in like a DOS. What happens if we allow like um, you know God mode sort of access into our containers? Like, what are the kind of like end results? Um, and I think it's it's going to take a while culturally for us to get there if we ever do, as far as sharing real incidents. Um, but simulating those incidents and injecting failures and learning from them, that's something that's generally a lot friendlier, um, just on kind of like the psyche, which means that people may talk about it more. But even if people don't talk about it, it means that you're still kind of experimenting, building really crucially, building muscle memory around how to respond to failure and respond to incidents, because burnout is a huge, huge problem among incident responders, both on the security side and then also with SREs. So as much as you can help them kind of prepare for the inevitable and get more comfortable with um, different like playbooks as far as how to respond to things. Um, 
the better. Like you're going to have a much better incident response program. You're going to be able to focus on more strategic work versus fighting fires all the time. So um, the TLDR is like experimentation is amazing. That's why uh, it's one of the core kind of components of any sort of science. And if we want to treat InfoSec more like a science than like a painful exercise and trying to like finger paint our way to a strategy, then Security <laughs> Cast and Engineering often offers basically one of the more scientific approaches, I would say, to InfoSec strategy. Yeah, I, I love the idea of cyber ranges and breach and attack simulation. I've been very bullish on, on a lot of those products. You know, but in, in my experience and in, in chatting with folks, it's been very difficult to convince people to throw the extra resources, you know, and a, a expense that you have to, uh, you, you know, even just getting a test environment up and running so you can do proofs of concepts on, on products you're considering. Uh, you know, can be can be tough to convince people to do. You know, <laughs> you know, we're not NASA over here. You, you know, if something bad happens, we'll we'll deal with it. You know, is is kind of the uh, uh, the attitude you get a lot of the time. I think with uh, security chaos engineering and chaos engineering more generally, one there's a lot of open source stuff, so you don't have to buy a tool. I also am somewhat uh, skeptical about some of those tools. Um, but that's probably a conversation for another time. Yeah, but there's, that would there, be a good conversation, though. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like using things like um, like serverless functions, that's a way that you can start injecting faults. Um, it's also making sure that you, um, I'll put it this way, like I remember seeing at uh, S4, gosh, pre the last S4 pre-pandemic, um, there was a talk, um, I'm totally blanking on the speaker's name, but she was talking about basically like doing um, chaos engineering sort of experiments, I believe it was for maybe a power plant, it was some sort of ICS. And if they can do it, promise most like Fortune 500s can absolutely do it. And I think this is a key area where as you're, as, at least as Adrian knows, and probably other people know, I'm a huge proponent of collaborating with engineering teams um, and people like SREs because they're, they also deeply care about resilience. It's a total myth that they don't care about security. Availability is like the new lifeblood for any organizations that's delivering a digital service, or as we saw with some of the ransomware cases, just uptime and availability is crucial for just any business that really uses software to do, like conduct their business operations. Um, so the engineering side of the house is absolutely gonna care about testing to see how systems respond to failure, especially on the availability side. Mm -hmm. So partner with them, like it's a lot, it's much easier to get buy-in for projects if you have two different teams like security and engineering who are telling, let's say, executives, like, hey, this is really important for us to do and get started, like starting a chaos engineering program. Um, you don't have to do it kind of in a silo, like find find friends where you can and justify business value beyond just security. Because um, frankly, again, like it doesn't matter if it's a developer, you know, who just wants to YOLO and yeet around and prod, or if it's an attacker who got like dev credentials and is doing something similar to like see what could be juicy for them. like. It's still an incident that looks very much the same from the incident responder perspective. So that kind of partnership with the with your engineering colleagues just goes a, like a really huge way towards um, justifying this sort of approach. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I'm a big fan of that the model with the site reliability engineers, and I feel like it doesn't have as much adoption as as we would like in security. But I think there's huge security benefits to building that for lack of a better term, agile team, right? That has all of the responsibilities for DevOps and security in one team. Yeah, I can also understand the security perspective, which is uh, there are benefits to claiming that the knowledge you have, in this case, you know, uh, InfoSec expertise can't be uh, discerned or accumulated by other people because it means you get right. paid more and you're more indispensable. So you have a slight incentive problem, I think, where InfoSec people can benefit from making the domain seem arcane and like they have to, you know, like for the most part, like an application performance monitoring tool mm -hmm. um, often provides the same sort of data that you would want for security purposes. However, if you are kind of uh, working with the engineering team who's running that APM tool and just adopting it for your own use cases, that's not coming out of your budget, which you'd think is a good thing, but a lot of times security team efficacy or the executive security executives are judged based on or um, you know, prove growth based on how much their budget is growing, how many tools were they able to implement, how big is the team. So hence the incentive problem where partnering and saving money for the organization isn't actually often in a kind of like, uh, it's not necessarily aligned with a security professional self-interest. And I think we definitely don't talk about that problem enough. Mm. 
No, I agree. I, I think the, the goals for some people might be uh, misunderstood, right? The goal is to get your teams to create resilient software. <laughs> I don't care whose budget it comes out of. As long as we're producing resilient software, I'm still going to have a job in security. And it, I think there's a lot of insecurity around that, right? Oh, yeah, there's tons of insecurity. And I think it's difficult to tell like a, I mean, any executive um, might think this would be true. Like, hey, actually, you only need half of your headcount and half of your budget because that can feel like, oh, I'm actually not important, whereas it's actually you're vital in making sure that your knowledge can scale and disseminate. Um, right. But it's it's a framing difference that I don't think the industry is fully embraced yet, for sure. Yeah, it's a shifting of that skills and knowledge into the other teams, which is, I think, a direction we need to push towards as an industry. Yep, database administration has been going in the same direction. You used to have you know, armies of DBAs, they would have a separate team, and now most of the time they're... Um, either embedded on product yep. uh, product and engineering teams directly or they serve as advisors um, mm -hmm. but the databases are actually maintained you know as part of the you know the beauty of devops is like everybody's like both responsible and accountable right. and uh, that's why i hate the terms of devsecops because security is a part of resilience which is a part of devops anyway so i think it's totally redundant and security done well um, would be sustainable enough that even if the security team all decided to you know take a vacation things wouldn't fall apart. If mm. things would fall apart, if your security team all like had a vacation for one week entirely, like that's a bad security program. Yeah, no, I agree. Well, Kelly, thank you so much for appearing on Enterprise Security Weekly. Thanks so much. And um, like I said, anyone who's using Deciduous, like please feel free to give Ryan or myself feedback because uh, we want to make it better for the community. Outstanding. Thank you. Coming up next, Deb Radcliffe from Cyber Risk Alliance. Stick around. <laughs>